Good. Once again, good morning. Welcome here to Central Baptist and a lot of folks are joining us. Maybe for the first time through live streaming, my name is Archie Mason. I'm the senior pastor of a large group uh, here today uh, in 11 o'clock service as we have in all of our services uh, here at Central. So thank you for those that are here, those that are engaging online. If you got a Bible with you, let's take it and turn to the book of Colossians. And so today we're going to pick up in Colossians chapter 4, we're going to pick up where Pastor Jonathan left off uh, last week. And so we're closing out uh, this study through the book of Colossians. Hey, uh, again, I just want to say to the church, thank you for that sabbatical uh, time being away. We had some great uh, guest preachers. Uh, all those guys are uh, my friends. Uh, Will Moore was a young guy uh, that was here. I knew him back when I was at Wynn Baptist, and I think he might have shared with you in the service that played baseball at Lions College. He used to bring guys that come to church here uh, when he was in school. And so, man, I appreciate those guys uh, so much. People have asked me, uh, they said, well, hey, what did, uh, what did God uh, teach you during the sabbatical? What did you learn? Uh, what did you come away with? And, and that stuff. And so uh, I'll share a few of those uh, uh, things today. I've also uh, been just observing and watching uh, out there. You know, people have different ideas about the pandemic and what is taking place. So there's been uh, questions that people have posed. They say, well, do you think, uh, well, they don't necessarily pose a question. They've kind of made a statement that the pandemic is the judgment of God upon the world uh, and that. And, you know, I'm not going to be the one to say, well, man, I, you know, I'm not 100% sure uh, either way. But you need to understand there have been pandemics that have happened in history all throughout history. And I'm not making a lot of this because I can tell you, almost all of us in here uh, and those of you watching, you either know somebody uh, have a family member or you yourself maybe contracted uh, COVID-19. I, mean, I got a friend, he's been quarantined twice uh, in this whole deal uh, that's going on. So not making a lot of that, uh, but man, there have been uh, some pandemics in history in the past. And I'll tell you what, some folks have kind of posed a question or made a statement. Well, we're in the tribulation time and this is a pandemic uh, that you're going to read about in tribulation. Let me tell you something. The ones in the tribulation time are a lot worse than what's going on right now and not making light of this. So there have been folks that have come up and have asked these questions and, and going on. So they say, well, this is a sign that Jesus is coming back. Well, guess what? Jesus is coming back. Amen. Y'all know that? He's coming back. And we're one day to a day closer to his return than we were yesterday. So he is coming back. So you may have the questions about, man, I don't know why this is happening. What's the reason about this? Well, I want to encourage you. Next week, we start uh, a new series called Upside Down. We're going to be teaching from Upside Down, seeing past the pain of the present. We're going to be teaching in the book of Psalms. And so uh, specifically those songs by King David because his life was upside down a lot. And so if you're downhearted, downtrodden, uh, discouraged, uh, kind of wondering about this, I believe those psalms are going to be uh, an encouragement to you. So I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Now, so some people say, well, hey, again, uh, this is Jesus. It's coming back. It's going to happen tomorrow. Well, the Bible says we don't know when that's going to happen. But here's one thing we do know, okay? Several things we know. Hey, we know that God is in control. Amen. Hey, we know God is in control. We know he loves us. And we know he's not willing that anybody perish, but all come to repentance. We know that, okay? We know, as I say, he's large and he's in charge, right? Hey, and we are his church. Come on, amen? We are his bride. And here's the thing you need to understand. Man, we are going to have church. This is we have from the very beginning. I know we were preaching online and doing that. Hey, we know a lot more than we knew then. And we're going to have church. Man, it's a big church. You can social distance. Uh, you can wear uh, a mask. Uh, you can do that. So we're going to have church. Uh, we're going to have baptisms. It's going to take place. Uh, Josh Stevenson, I was talking with them about that this morning, our staff meeting. And I said, hey, man. Uh, I know we got a lot of folks that need to be baptized. Uh, we're going to have baptism starting like next Sunday. And he said, hey, the CDC is recommending that uh, people go to swimming pools. It's got chlorine in it. I said, good. Throw some, throw some bleach in that thing or something. Uh, throw some chlorine in. Somebody said, they may come out green. I said, they baptize in the name of Jesus. They'll be green. It's okay. And so, uh, y'all don't even think that's funny, do you? And so, you know, people have asked the question, what do we do uh, as a church? We're going to be the church, okay? We have to function in this environment. I, I have a confession, you know, confession to you. Confession is agreeing with God. So I'm not necessarily agreeing with you. I'm just going to confess. I'm going to share with you something, probably where I've failed as a leader. When this thing started in March and we didn't know what was happening, didn't know anything about it. Uh, it was just hitting the United States. My whole mindset was, well, okay. And I'm listening and observing and reading. My mindset was, well, if we get through March and April, if we can survive March and April, survive the next two weeks, well, when summer gets here, the COVID virus will die. 
That didn't happen, okay? And, uh, and so all of a sudden we get the first summer and we thought, well, hey, let's get to August when it gets 110 degrees and the COVID virus will die. That didn't necessarily happen. And now we find ourselves here, school is about to start. And if, if we don't watch it, we will allow ourselves to sit around. To, stay with me, okay? And I'm confessing. We'll allow ourselves to sit around and just try to go in survival mode and say, hey, let's just let this thing get past. And when it get past, things will go back to normal. What if God doesn't want his church to go back to normal? This passage we're going to look at in Colossians, it's the end of the book, his letter that Paul's writing, and writing to the church of Colossae. And in it, he lays out some truths. These are, it's God's word inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Hey, come on, that ain't loud enough. We're going to stop and preach on the doctrine of the word of God, okay? It is the inspired word of God. It's God breathed. Amen. That's better. Thank you. Okay. It'd be a long day. You're the last service. All right. And so it's God breathed, and it's his word in times of peace. It's his word in times of a pandemic. It's his word uh, in times of war that's taking place out there and terroristic threatening and, and all that stuff. And again, it's his time, it's his word when everything's going well. And you know, too, people have asked me, they say, well, what about what we see out there uh, in the environment, in our culture? It's total anarchy. It's chaos. Uh, it's all this stuff. Let me give you the biblical answer to what we see. What we see taking place in the United States of America and around the world with all the violence, murder, and all that stuff that we see is the spirit of the Antichrist. Do you hear me on that? You need to go read in the New Testament. See in the New Testament, see it in the book of Revelation. It is the spirit of the Antichrist. And when you see that stuff happening, you got to realize, hey, there is a... There is the adversary that's out there. There is the enemy. His name is Satan. The spirit of the Antichrist has always existed that has moved around, uh, that is pointed toward the end of the world. And that's where people go, well, the end of the world is coming. Well, guess what? Jesus is coming back. But here's what we need to understand. We are here in Jonesboro, Arkansas, right? This is not New York. This is not Buffalo, okay? This is not Montana. This is not New Mexico. This is not Arizona. You say, you're mixing states and cities. I know what I'm just rambling. You know, this is not Louisiana. This is Jonesboro, Arkansas, and God has put his church, Central Baptist, here for such a time as this. And so in the midst of this, we say, okay, how do we function? How do we operate? And what we see out of this passing clock is these four truths, four very simple truths, yet profound of who we are to be as a church and how we go through in times of peace, in times when there's not chaos, uh, in times when there's not confusion, but also in the midst of a pandemic. And that's what we're going to look at today. Hey, would you stand with me for the uh, public reading of Scripture, Colossians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 2, just going to read down uh, through verse 6, but then we'll talk about the rest of the passage starting in verse 7. Here we go. Devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I've also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be seasoned, or let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Here's what we're going to see. We're going to talk about prayer, being devoted to prayer, okay? We're going to talk about uh, conduct, uh, behaving in wisdom toward outsiders, those who are in blues. We're going to talk about speech being seasoned with salt, and we're going to talk about being people of purpose. Four truths we see that apply to us today uh, as a church is we start and go forward being the bride of Christ and who he wants us to be, all right? Let's pray. Father, again, we say thank you. We can't say thank you enough. Thank you put breath in our lungs. You woke us up this morning. Uh, Lord, I know. Hey, we look around. There's so many things we say we don't understand, we don't know, but here's what we do know. We know you are God. We know you are on the throne. We know you are in charge. And Lord, we know you're good. And Lord, we trust you. And we look to you. And Lord, I pray you, Holy Spirit, give us illumination this passage as we talk about laying a hold of you, God. Give us illumination to understand, uh, Lord, this passage, Scripture, and apply it to our life. And Lord, I pray you save somebody uh, today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated, uh, if you would. Again, uh, thank you uh, for being here today uh, and engaging and being part uh, of worship here at Central Baptist Church. So let's talk about this devotion to prayer, okay? Uh, you'll see this as it'll come up on the screen. It's ready. He says, devote yourself to prayer. And there's a word there that means to persist. It means to 
be steadfast. Uh, it means to be focused. Prayer is talking with God, uh, communing with God. It's also listening to God. You know, sometimes in my past as a, as a pastor, uh, people would come up and they would say, man, God told me this. And uh, I was in a prayer time and God said this to me. And, and God speaks in times of prayer. Amen. I mean, that's what he does. But God does not contradict his word. And so when you have a friend or a family member comes up and says, God says this, and it's some off the wall, squirreliest thing you've ever heard of your life that contradicts the word of God, you just kind of smile, you know, and look at it because we could talk about it with grace and speech and season with salt and go, that, that's not of God because it contradicts his word. And I don't know who, what you heard, but that was not from him. You know, see, it will not. So in prayer, just remember this, in prayer, uh, it'd be, man, the Lord speaks, but it's also that we listen, but it never contradicts the word of God. So what Paul is saying, he says, devote yourself. He says, to persist. Uh, if you got a Bible with you, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, very quickly, let's flip over to Hebrews. If you got your app on your phone, uh, <coughs> you can see that. Hebrews chapter 4, uh, and it says this in verse 15. For we do not have an high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet is without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, I love that passage, okay? Because think about the Lord Jesus right now, right? Nothing catches him by surprise. Does he love us? Y'all are not fired up today, okay? Let me, uh, he loves us. He died on the cross for us. He shed his blood uh, for us on the cross. I mean, they beat him. They whipped him. They put the crown of thorns upon his head. And, and even in that, in his visage, they plucked a beard out of his face. I don't even like somebody pulling an eyebrow uh, out of my head. They plucked the beard. He was so beaten, so unrecognizable. The Bible says his visage, you couldn't, you did not know who he was. He did that for you and me. We do not deserve that, okay? That's how much uh, he loves us and he cares for us. Now, but also he's in uh, a resurrected body. He's resurrected body. He's in heaven, nail scars in his hand. And when he says, you have a, a great high priest who can sympathize with, you know, Jesus, how many of you ever had the stomach virus? Oh, yeah. Isn't that terrible, right? It's terrible. You're probably saying, don't, don't say that, Archie. We'll get it. Uh, look, Jesus had the stomach virus. Jesus understands how you feel. Uh, how many of you have ever been criticized? Anybody ever been criticized? I mean, you've been maligned maybe on Facebook or something like that, or somebody ugly to you, somebody bullying you, that kind of stuff. Jesus knows how you feel, you know. Uh, how many, well, don't raise your hand on this one. How many of you had a family member turn on you? Don't raise your hand. Jesus knows how you feel. His brothers, sisters, they showed up, okay, to take him away. They thought it was crazy kind of thing. I mean, you read that inscription in the book of Matthew. So uh, he knows how you feel. Now, that ought to make all of us believers go, oh, that's so good. I mean, it does me because I know he knows. I mean, we're in a pandemic. We have uh, church family members who lost their businesses in this pandemic. I mean, and Jesus, when he says the foxes have a hole and the birds have a nest, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I mean, Jesus understands what it's like. He's out there doing ministry. He's walking by faith. We know he's the Son of God. And, you know, there's people, I mean, God's, the Father's meeting his needs and this. But he understands what it's like not to have uh, anything or to be faced with this stuff. So this is who we have to call upon. Now, so we can't just teach on prayer. That would be probably several messages. And so I just want to share something with you about prayer. So we have the high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but he tells us to persist. Uh, if you got your Bible with you, also, if you don't mind, flip over to uh, Luke uh, chapter uh, 5, uh, or excuse me, Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Flip over to Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Let me read this to you. This is the instruction on prayer. This is where he says, they say, how do we pray? He says, you pray this way. I follow, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom kind of will be done. But then when you get to verse 5, he's also teaching. He says, in a parable, he says, then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend who, and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. So he's talking about, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. Uh, now, I've always got a project. People ask me, what have you been doing this time you've been off? Well, Angie and I are uh, able to, you know, get away, do some stuff. But, uh, you know, I've been, like, working on water lines. When you do your own plumbing and you're not a plumber, 
you usually have to replumb what you plumbed yourself. Anybody with me on that? Okay, so I mean, the ground's as hard as concrete out there now. I've been digging stuff up. I got a few leaks, you know, because I thought I could do that. I don't know what happened. I'm blaming the glue or whatever it was, you know. And so, and so I just want you to know, man, I, I'm, I, I'm, I can't sit. I'm outside a lot. I've been sweating a lot, been stinking a lot, you know, and that stuff. And I say getting the toxins out. I've been drinking a lot of water. But when I come in the house in the evening, I want you to know, Angie and I, we set that air conditioner on Arctic snow, right? You with me? I mean, you walk in, it's like, oh, hey, I take my clothes off and go back and put them in the washer and turn the wash on. I jump in the shower. I get cleaned up. I get out, and I have a pair of penguin pajama bottoms. They're pe- like penguins on them. They're penguin pajama bottoms. And then I got one of those T-shirts. I don't know what it's called. It's real soft. Uh, when we buy T-shirts at the church, I tell them, I say, number one, ladies, please forgive me. I say, I don't want, like, girly colors, you know, I want like man colors on t-shirt and whatever that means, you know, like blue or black or something. I guess that could be a girl color, but I don't, I don't want, I just want that. And I said, I want them soft t-shirts. I want the kind of, I don't know what they are. They're soft. And Bob's like, I know what you want, that kind of stuff. So I got one of those. It's an extra large or double X. I'm honest, you know, so I put that on and I walk in there and I sit in a recliner and I cock that thing back and I got my feet propped up there. And this is usually my first thought. I hope nobody comes by my house. <laughs> How many of y'all women? Can I get a witness? I mean, really, you're like, you don't like people? Man, look, 6.30, 7 o'clock, whatever, it's 8. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to get up. I don't have to change out my pajama bottoms. You know, so when I read this, I'm thinking, this dude's in bed. His kids are in bed. If you got young kids, somebody's beating on your door, ringing the doorbell, you're like, you wake my kids up, I'm going to hurt you. I know what you're thinking. I mean, Angie and I have been like that before. Like, do not wake those babies up, ringing that doorbell, whatever. Some of you put a sign out there, do not ring this doorbell, or the wrath of mama bear is going to come out on you, you know. That kind of stuff. So he's in there and he says, hey, my kids are in bed. You need to go away. I know you're my friend. You're my neighbor. I can't help you. I got my pajama bottoms on. I got my T-shirt on. I'm laid back. But look at what the Lord says. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. There's another parable that we find in Luke where the widow goes for the judge and the judge says, like she's like wearing me out she's wearied me so I'm going to give her what she wants now it's not that it's not that prayer wearies the Lord but what the Lord is requesting he wants us to be persistent uh Angie and I are not the most technically advanced people okay whatsoever We're, we always have issues with phones or computers you know you know you you're, you're probably that person like well just do this do that do that and you're like uh, Angie went to a daughter-in-law's birthday party and the daughter-in-law's brother fixed her I watched a parrot with her phone we could not figure that thing out uh yesterday you know so some of your kids you can do it we're not like that let me tell you what man when when I want to punch uh, KIT weather out, and I want to see what Ryan Vaughn has to say about weather because I'm older and I look at the weather like all day long, even though it makes no difference to what I'm doing. I watch it. And when that app doesn't come up, and you know, I'm like, Ryan, what are you doing? The app doesn't work. Why can't you? And I'm punching it, and then I want to, because why is that? Because immediate gratification is what we look for, right? We want it, we want it now. What about your prayer life? If our prayer life is immediate gratification, you say, oh, well, Jesus, he sympathizes with our weaknesses, yeah? Oh, oh, Jesus, I got the stomach virus. Please help me. He's like, yeah, I know how you feel. Jesus, per- people are criticizing me. Please help me. Yep. Yeah. He says, persist. Be devoted. Uh, one other passage, and I know we spend more time in this part than any other. Flip over to uh, Genesis chapter 32, real quick. Genesis 32. Uh, if you don't know the story of Jacob and Esau, uh, Jacob and Esau, they do not get along. Uh, they've separated. And then the Lord tells Jacob, go back home. And you go back and read it if you don't know it. And so uh, uh, Jacob's going back. Last thing Esau, he knew about Esau, Esau was going to kill him, his brother. He's going to kill him. And so uh, Jacob starts sending gifts on ahead and camels and all this stuff. And he has a bunch of kids and he has two wives. And he's sending them on. And he says, you tell them, you tell Esau that this is a gift and that I'm coming. And so every group that would go forward, they'd say, this is a gift from your brother Jacob, and he's coming. And, and somebody kind of like circles back around and said, your brother has 400 men with him coming to you. And Jacob's like, I'm going to die. Well, the Bible tells the story, and it tells that Jacob is found alone, and he's waiting till that, that morning uh, to go to meet Esau. And this picks up in verse 24. It says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, now wrestling, okay, it's like physical wrestling, like, you know, headlock kind of stuff. And so kind of get that idea. He says, when he saw he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh. 
And so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with it. What, what Jacob was doing, he's wrestling with the Lord. He's struggling with the Lord. He's grappling, if that's a real kind of word, he's grappling with the Lord. And so uh, he says, then he says, so the Lord says, let me go for the dawn is breaking. Now look at what Jacob says. But he said, now what we don't want to do, I don't want to make the text something it's not, okay? Because there's a lot in this text right here. He says, uh, let me go for the dawn is breaking, but here's what Jacob said. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Okay. Now that was a whole bunch back to devote yourself to prayer. We need to lay hold of God. It's not going to be necessarily immediate gratification. It's not going to be punch an app, get your answer, and move on. can be. You know, you may be walking with the Lord, and that's kind of how it works. But there are a lot of things that the Lord, and he says, persist, wrestle with him, grapple with him. Uh, but the reason that a lot of us don't want to wrestle with the Lord in prayer is because we don't want him touching the socket of our thigh. You say, aren't you going to have a hip dislocated? Well, in a spiritual sense, when you go before the Lord, I read this in a commentary where is speaking of a previous author, I think this author has died. They said what most Christians today don't understand is that when you go to the Lord in prayer, you're sticking your head in the mouth of a lion. You see, we have this idea of Jesus being our yes, he understands our weaknesses and sympathizes with us and he loves us and he died on the cross for us. And we, we understand what well, he says persist. And a lot of people ask the question, why should we persist if he already knows what we want? Because he, he wants us to persist. He wants us to wrestle. He wants us to grapple because we begin to pray. We'll begin to understand and pray his will. But we're also afraid of the consequences of what may happen. You know, that he may pick us up and put us over here. Now, let's take that and relate that to the church, okay? So, here we are in the midst of a pandemic. If you're like me, you thought it's going to be over with. I thought everything would start back as normal. Uh, you know, SEC football would play all the games. The Sun Belt Conference would play all the games, uh, you know. And, and now, schools are doing the best they can, and they're preparing, and they're trying, and they're moving ahead. And this thing uh, doesn't seem to uh, be over with necessarily. Again, we know more than we knew now. And so, maybe that's kind of uh, where uh, we found ourselves. And what if we've been sitting around thinking, well, I just can't wait till things get back to normal, but God does not want us take us back to what normal was. He wants us to lay hold of him. You know, and you say, well, aren't you, what, what do we know? I know that God wants a church, his bride, filled with the Spirit of God. I mean, the church should be a place of power of the Spirit of God. And I'm not talking about anything that's weird. You know, so you say, well, that means miracles can happen. Yes. Hey, can, can the Lord do miracles today? Yes. Does he do miracles today? Yes. You say, well, if God would come down and do a miracle, there'd be thousands upon people would believe. No, they wouldn't. Because he said himself, I mean, you do miracles, just because miracles are done do not mean you're going to believe in the gospel. What if he does not want us to go back uh, to what normal was before? And you say, Archie, we're going to change the service schedule. No. <laughs> you know, some of y'all 2009, I did that. Okay. Uh, Archie, we're going to change like groups and stuff. No. Uh, we're still going to have a group. And by the way, some of you kind of wonder about this. Hey, our groups, uh, we've had groups meeting. Uh, some been meeting on campus, some been meeting off campus, some been having stuff outside uh, and doing that. Uh, but after Labor Day, groups back on campus, you'll have opportunity to meet in different places, but kind of got to be distance out. But groups are coming back. Uh, all the stuff for our kids, uh, you know, coming back uh, after Labor Day, Wednesday nights uh, after Labor Day, uh, coming back. And uh, you know what? Uh, you say, well, I don't like it. Uh, I don't want it to, to be like this. But, but God has us here for such a time as this. And, and God wants us to lay hold of him. Hey, and he wants us to struggle with him and grapple with him and, and not to be afraid of that. Does God want revival? Yes. Come on. Does God want revival? Yes. He's not willing for anybody to perish, for all to come to repentance. But do you truly do I truly want revival? Because you know what? We can pray and lay hold of God for, re for revival, but realize we're sticking our head in the lion's mouth in a good way. And do you realize that we can pray for that and lay hold of that, but we may come away limping? Hey, you say, what in the world do you mean? There has been many of a man who's laid hold of God. God told him to sell his house. God told him to sell his business. God told him to go do this. God told him to pick up his family and move to the furthest continent away from here, whichever one that is. And God told him to immerse himself there. Nobody's going to know your name forever, and they're going to bury you in the dirt of that country. 
but you will glorify Jesus. You see, that's when he talks about people come away walking. So I know we spent a lot of time there, but to persist, okay, in prayer. But he says to be alert, okay? To be alert means to be watchful. It means to pay uh, attention. Uh, hey, man, I loved our guest preachers we had. They're my friends. But I tell you what, I caught myself in my recliner. That's the reason I figured out I can't do this very well at home. I know a lot of folks, you got you to figure out how to, how to engage, how to be a part of that, how to do that. I had to get outside, but I fell asleep. You're like, no way. You should have been praying. Yes, I should have been. I fell asleep. And that's the idea. Be alert. Pay attention in this. And you said, we should have been alert. Should have been paying attention in prayer. And not re- I got in that recliner and cocked that thing back and threw my feet up and I was out. You know, and so it says, be alert. But he also says this. He says, with thanksgiving. Man, be grateful for salvation. Amen. Hey, be grateful for salvation. And you may say, uh, this is, this is kind of weird in a way. You are here by the sovereignty of God. Okay. You're here by the sovereignty of God. We should be grateful. I don't want to be weird because I know a lot of people have suffered uh, during this time. So it's not weird. But as a believer, uh, we need to be thankful that God has us here for such a time is this. Now, does that mean you got to like it? I don't necessarily like all of it uh, and all that stuff, but that's just the idea. So thankful for salvation, thankful that we're here. Man, I'll tell you what, uh, go away for five weeks and miss this body. And, and if you don't miss it, when you come back, something's not right with you. I just want you to know that. Man, I've been away. It's been a good time of, of trying to disconnect. I'm not very good at that. But, man, I miss you guys, okay? I miss being with the church. I miss being here uh, on Sunday morning uh, with that. Be thankful. Don't take it for granted. You know, we're going to have an invitation here in just a few minutes. And we're going to have a face mask on. And, man, I'm going to have mine on. And you may say, uh, hey, let me tell you something about this bandana. Uh, so this morning I was sharing this, and a guy came up to me afterward, and he said, hey, I got four bandanas for you. And I'm like, you came to church with four bandanas in your pocket. Okay, are they clean? Yes. Anyway, I've been wearing this around. Uh, I've been wearing bandanas during this deal. Well, excuse me. I've been wearing a bandana during this crisis. And so uh, I've been traveling. been to Alabama, been to Mississippi, been to Florida, and I've been wearing this purple bandana. And uh, so just the other day, I, over the weekend, I guess, it might have been Friday or Saturday afternoon or something. And so there's a convenience store, and this bandana stays on the dash of my truck, this purple one. And uh, I got out, I put that thing around me, and I tied it, and I began to walk to the convenience store, and I thought, you know, this bandana's been in about three different states. And then I thought, this bandana's been in my pocket several times. And then I thought, this bandana's been on the dash of my truck. And then as I walked in the door, I thought, I've wore this bandana for five weeks and have never washed it one time. <laughs> and I've read enough about stuff thinking, that's not what you're supposed to do with these face coverings. So anyway, the guy came up this morning and, uh, and he gave this to me. Now, when we think about this idea of like being grateful, look, man, I know this and, and the stuff that we're in, but I, I tell you what, God has given us a tremendous opportunity, even in the midst uh, of this stuff. And we cannot miss that, okay? And that's why, again, I want to encourage you to be back next week as we kind of begin that new series and go through the Psalms. But also what we see, Paul, he tells him, he says, hey, pray for me that I may speak a word, the mystery of God. Now, Paul's in prison. If I was in prison today and I'd done nothing wrong, there'd been a false allegation against me, a false accusation or whatever that occurred, and I was in prison and I was able to write back to the church I would probably be writing back. This would be my prayer request. Hey, church, would you pray that I'd get released out of this prison? Would you pray that I'd find favor before the judge? Uh, Would you pray uh, there'd be justice for this person that's accusing me that has me in here? But that's not what Paul prays. Paul, when he's asking the church uh, to pray for him, uh, when he's uh, uh, written to him, he says that, hey, pray that I may be able to be a door open, that I may be able to speak the word. Okay, now... This is the gospel. There is a great opportunity of the gospel. I just want to encourage us. Do not miss the opportunities of the gospel. You've got to have uh, conversations with people uh, that this can come up in. You can go back. Hey, here's what the Lord uh, did in my life. You may be in some squirrely conversation, off the wall, argumentative type, you know, people in defiance and defensive or whatever. Uh, and you may say, yeah, that's our family meal that we have sometimes. I mean, it could be something like that, but you can say, hey, here's what, and that's kind of a joke, but here's what God did in my life. You bring it back to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the first truth we see is that we are to devote 
ourselves to prayer. So we're to persist. We're to be alert. Uh, we're to pay attention. Uh, we're to be looking. But look at what else he says also. He says, not only devote yourself to prayer, you know, and do that and pray that I may speak the gospel, but also in verse 5 he says, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders and make the most of the opportunity. I've shared this before with you is that, uh, well, just for instance, today I'm on the phone just last week and I called this organization. I said, hey, I said, uh, man, I got this issue going on and it's not bad or whatever and I'm trying to explain it. And I said, can you uh, email me uh, all this stuff? And he's like, well, yeah, we can't do this. We can do this. And so he sends it to me. And then when he gets, and I didn't recognize him. He gets, and when he gets done, he says, hey, he says, uh, pastor, I went, uh oh, you know, he said, uh, man, I'm a part of a church. I said, man, I know that. I said, thank you. You know, thank you for what you're doing. You never know who you are around. And do you realize it's your conduct? You can say one thing, but if your conduct does not match up what you say, you've lost all credibility. And so, what he tells us in the midst of this, now, here's where I'm going with this. And let me just throw the next one out there. He says, may your, your speech, okay, be with grace, be with kindness, and may it be seasoned with salt, okay? And again, make the most of opportunity. This is a politically charged environment. Y'all realize that? You say, uh, uh-huh. Uh, you, maybe you've had several discussions with people. Uh, guess what? There's going to be an election coming up or elections in November. You're a citizen of the United States. You get to vote. So just go uh, vote your conscience, do whatever, right? But it's a politically charged environment. And people have opinions, not just in politics, but in everything. It can be, hey, I'm the guy, the preacher. So if people are for face masks or against face masks, I hear both sides. I've read everything. If people are for social distancing or against social distancing, I hear that. If people say, well, the church should do this or the church should do that, I hear that. Okay. And, you know, you kind of do that. Now, so you may be at a place that that kind of stuff happens. So it's a politically charged environment. It's all the stuff that's going on uh, out there. And so we have an opportunity with our speech and our conduct to be a witness uh, for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so uh, back about six weeks ago, I get a phone call. I'm on the executive board of the uh, SBC uh, committee. And so I get a phone call and they said, hey, Archie, uh, we're electing new officers for the year. We want you to be the vice president of the uh, executive board. And uh, so I gave the godly answer. I'll pray about it. But in my mind, I'm going, nope, nope, no way on God's green earth am I doing that. Okay. Uh, and so, the, you know, about two days after they called me back, hey, would you do that? So I gave the godly answer. Nope. Nope, nope. And uh, they said, you need to do this. You need to take a role in this. We need somebody like you. And so my response was, that's not my wheelhouse. Okay, that's just not my wheelhouse. And just last week, I get another phone call. And I said, hey, Archie, from the new president, he calls me and he says, hey, I've got a finance stewardship team. Man, I need you to be the VP of that team. I gave the guy the answer. I'll pray about it. In my mind, I'm thinking, nope, nope, I'm not doing that. Uh, and then Ronnie Floyd, the head of the guru of everything, sends me a text. I need you to do this. And he guilted me into it. So I said, yes. So anyway, let me tell you why I said no in complete transparency and honesty, okay, in all things. I have set back. I've been in a lot of Zoom meetings. I like Zoom meetings for content information. I can get a lot done. I don't have to travel, so I'm good with that. I don't have to see people, hug people. I'm good. Just let's get it over with. i got a lot to do. Come on, amen? I'm being transparent, so I'm just like it. You may not be like that. Me, I'm like that. But uh, I've been in enough of those meetings. I have watched pastors vilify and criticize other pastors in the SBC. I was in one meeting that just went on and on and on. And this is right after they called me and asked me to be the VP of that. And I gave the spiritual answer and said, nope, not on God's green earth am I doing that. I sat in that meeting. I turned my video off so they couldn't see my face. And I was like, dear Lord Jesus, thank you. Did I not agree to do that? Because I would want to kill somebody right now. Now, you may say, I thought in SBC work, pastors like float around on clouds like angels. And their speech is so kind to one another. I tell you what I've learned through all this. There's some mean pastors out there who say they're speaking in the name of Jesus, it'll make your stomach turn. The reason I did not want to serve in one of those positions, because I didn't want to be criticized and vilified across the nation, because everybody's got an opinion, and they all think they have to tell you their opinion all the time. And you get in a situation like you cannot please everybody. This is church life. This is Baptist people. These are people that are standing in pulpits preaching 
this morning, and they are writing blogs and editorials and chewing people out and saying stuff, and it's, it's just almost like a, uh, a daggum fight uh, all the time. And so there's a part of me like, I ain't got time for that. I don't want that uh, in my life. And that's when he says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. Now, here's the here's thought, and we're coming close to invitation is, man, you got to ask yourself, I'm not a Facebook person. Facebook's got pros and cons. And so Angie uh, does pretty good. Like somebody has a baby in the church and we didn't know that. And then you, and, you know, Facebook, man, the baby pictures come out and Angie just like, hey, so-and-so had a baby. And I said, yeah, I knew she was pregnant. I knew she was due, but I hadn't heard that. Nobody else heard it. And so I'll call the church or call one of the pastors. Hey, so-and-so had their baby. It's a good thing. Or, you know, we've done a lot of graveside services during the COVID uh pandemic outbreak and all that stuff and so somebody passes away and somebody puts something on Facebook the pro that angels are hey so-and-so lost their sister or their dad passed away and so and it's the good stuff but but also what has happened is that man people just come out and maybe they are sitting in their penguin pajama bottoms man and they're topping away on their phone or the iPad and and you got believers that seem to be this very critical and saying very harsh things. But, and sometimes you don't say, this is all in the name of Jesus. We're to be the, the salt and the light of the earth. You know, and I've learned in the church, I've, I've just learned. I don't take that stuff personal. Everybody in the church is an armchair quarterback. I don't say everybody. Let me back that up. A lot of people in the church can be armchair quarterbacks to where, well, you should have done this and you should have done that. And I've just learned that a lot of times there's a lot of uh, validness and criticism that you can learn from. But I've just learned that I just have to smile and uh, kind of say, hey, you know, it's all good. It's okay. This is why, you know, and just go on because there's more at stake. There are people who do not know Jesus. And I just want to encourage you. And we, we, as we get ready for this invitation, man, if, if your life, if you've been part of that, well, you just want to engage and you just want to jump on people. And you say, man, I'm, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. Look, we ought to be seasoned with salt. A lot of times Angie and I uh, will sit down and she'll say, hey, does it need salt? And I say, it's a little bland. Could you give me the salt? And the thing is, it's a good meal. It tastes a little better. There are things that you can say in the right way the people in the name of Jesus by spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on. That's the whole, this whole passage here. He said, not the whole passage, but this part. He says, let your speech, let it be with grace, okay, as though Caesar saw. So if you look out around the world and you say, man, it's chaos, it's anarchy, this is happening, and that is happening. Listen to me, the spiritual answer, it's the spirit of the Antichrist. You know, and you say, well, then I'm going to go out and tell them, y'all are of the devil. You're of Satan, and you're going to burn in a fiery pit uh, in a place called hell. Okay, now, let me just, let's pull that one back just a little bit. Okay, look, folks are lost. There are people who need Jesus. Is there going to be separation between believers and unbelievers? Yes. Is the Lord, uh, he says, I'm not willing for any prayers all to come to repentance. There is a way of sharing uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, and when, when someone comes to you and says, well, I believe this, it's okay to smile and go, hey, here's what Jesus says. Here's what the Bible says, you know. And you say, well, they elevated their voice at me. Well, that does not mean you've got to elevate your voice, Okay. We are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who have a citizenship in heaven. This place is not our home. We are here for such a time as this. Yes, are we going to stand up and speak truth? Yes, are we going to stand up for the unborn? Uh, yes, are we going to stand up for the older generation? Yes, are we going to preach the gospel? He says, let it be seasoned with salt. We live in a culture where everybody has an opinion and everybody thinks they need to share that opinion. And you can share your opinion, but it's got to be done in the right way. Come on. Amen. And so he sees us here. So whether in times of peace or whether in times. So what we have is taking place out there, which what's going on with the pandemic, what's going on in the political environment. Now, you got people at both places and God has a church here for such a time as this. Now, here's the last part. We're going to be people of purpose. Now, I didn't read all that, several verses, but he mentions some very specific names. He mentions one, Tenichius, that's kind of how you pronounce that. Uh, Aristarchus, they're hard names to pronounce. Uh, he mentions another one, Justice. He mentions Luke, the physician. You know him, Mark, the deserter. Uh, Epaphras, he's been mentioned several times in the book of Colossians. These were people who served with purpose, they had a purpose. Okay, now, we are a church to be people of purpose. Here's how this thing boils down. 
God, if you're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has given you purpose, okay? You may say, I don't like this. Uh, well, look, I don't like mosquitoes, and I don't like the humidity as high as it's been. But I live in Arkansas, okay? Uh, you can say there's a lot of things we don't like, but God has us here for such a time as this. Folks, we are his church, okay? He tells us this in the book of Matthew. He says that he shall build his church and the gate of Hades will not prevail against his church, okay? Uh, we are his bride. Uh, you may say, well, I wish it was different. Well, guess what? Let's lay hold of him in prayer. And let's say, Lord, come on. Uh, uh, Lord, make this thing different. Let's lay hold of him in prayer and say, Lord, uh, in the COVID virus, uh, heal people uh, that are sick. Let's lay hold of him in prayer and say, Lord, uh, send revival so that people will be saved. Let's lay hold of him in prayer. He says, blessed is the nation whose God is their Lord. Let's say, uh, Lord, lay hold of him in prayer and say, Lord, we want you to be the ruler of this nation. Uh, Lord, we want uh, global-wide uh, revival uh, to take place. And, and sometimes we say those things, we get all fired up and say, man, if 8,000 people in Central would come together and they would pray that way, it would happen. Uh, it usually does not work that way. It's usually not 8,000 mass group of people. It's usually a few. And that's how God chooses to work. Now, I'm going to ask our, our guys to come up here, uh, join me on the platform, our musicians, as we go on this invitation. But this may be how you need to respond today. Maybe today this is a place where you go, hey, you know what? I've not persisted in prayer. Maybe you've been so afraid of what God may ask you to do that you won't lay hold of him. I want you to put that fear aside. You say, man, aren't you? I don't want to hit replacement. I don't, I'm not making fun of that, okay? But you're saying, I don't want to walk away with a limp. I don't want to experience the consequences of God's answered prayer. He may ask me to do something that was not in my plan. He may ask me to do something that's not in my wheelhouse. He may pick me up and move me over here. If he picks you up from here and moves you over there, that's the best thing could ever happen uh, in your life. I can guarantee you that on that. And so maybe that's your response. Maybe... You just need to pray and say, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's a Psalm 51 prayer from King David. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Have you lost the joy of the Lord? I mean, if you look around, it's what the Spirit of the Antichrist wants to do. He wants to just draw the joy of the Lord out of you. Uh, you know, and I'm the guy, I watch the news. I do. I want to know what's going on around the world. And so I watch the world news. I watch stuff. And, and you know, you watch that stuff and you think, man, I'm just getting discouraged uh, by what's taking place. You know, people say that's newsworthy. And it's like nothing good. It's all bad, you know, in that. But to, to understand that in the midst of that, the Lord says you can have joy in his salvation. Maybe that's how you need to pray. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. Maybe it's a recommitment. Maybe you've been sitting on the sidelines. Maybe you've been idle. Maybe it's been a, you put it in part and said, I'm going to wait this thing out uh, till it's over with. And then, you know, then I'm going to get involved with the Lord. And I'm going to serve him and I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe that's your response. There'll be pastors here. Uh, they'll have their mask on. If you come forward today uh, and you don't have a mask, uh, we got some down here, uh, some new ones, you know, uh, there. And you say, well, Arch, you've been in three states and you say that's a clean bandana. I'm not sure. I don't, wanna, I don't want you praying for me. That's okay. There's other pastors. You're not going to offend me, okay, or anything like that. Uh, so we encourage you. But I also know this, that here and those who are watching, there's somebody not saved. You're not born again. And you know it. Hey, you sense the heaviness. You sense the disconnect. You sense the guilt, the shame. You sense no purpose. I told somebody, we were talking about something uh, the other day. I mean, where I live, the grass looks like this platform. It's just brown. It's dead. Uh, one of my friends said, yeah, Jonah needs to move out of this neighborhood, you know, or something. And uh, uh, I think he thought he's pointing me or something. So anyway, and, you know, someone said, I just work so hard. And he said, I just can't, I can't get ahead. And I said, Ecclesiastes. Everything on the side is just striving. Now, do we work? Yes. And do we work hard? Yes. But the purpose, you say, what's well, my career? It'll never fulfill you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you have a fulfilling career if the Lord is your Lord? Yes, you can. But you got to repent. you got to come to Him in faith. You say, what's repentance? It's turning away and saying, it's admitting I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Lord Jesus, you're right. I'm wrong. Lord Jesus, take control of my life. Lord, I repent. Lord, here I am. Hey, he'll save you today. And so whether you're online, there's some pastors engaging with you online, or whether you're here, pastors be here. I see Pastor Don, Pastor Bill, Pastor Adam back there. Be others that have a mask on. Maybe someone come and say, hey, today, now I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. We, and you may say, hey, I'm ready to be baptized some of that chlorine water. You know, put some bleach in there or something. 
I, it's not a joke, but really, you may say, man, I need to follow up in believer's baptism. You know, you know the Holy Spirit, I got saved. And there was a time after that, through the study of the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit of God put upon my heart. I needed to be baptized by immersion. Nobody told me that. I didn't, it's not that I didn't know that. It's like nobody said, hey, you need to get baptized by immersion. It's the Holy Spirit of God. Maybe that's where you are. That's your commitment today. Hey, join me as we pray. Father, again, in the name of Jesus, we pray because there's no one else. Lord, do a working a day. Lord, I know, I, I sense even in our community and with people and the unknowns. And Lord, I know there's fear. But then I know also some folks have been just like me. It's kind of like, well, let's just get through this and then it can get back to the way it was. But Lord, it's not that the way it was was bad, but Lord, I believe you may have something that's different. Uh, A new strengthening, a new engagement, a new being filled with your spirit, the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And so Lord, it may just be that folks today just need to grab hold of you in prayer, but it's also that people need to be saved. So I pray, Lord, do that work today. I pray I don't want to be ashamed of you, Lord. I pray as people want to come and pray, they feel, they feel open to pray. And so, Lord, I pray you do this, your name, for your glory. We pray. Amen. Amen. Can we stand our feet, please?